Three. Yeah, that's great. Um, so yeah, Alessa mentioned well how to write an award winning paper is a bit maybe too much, but the key idea is how to be understood by your peers, your peers being your colleagues, your supervisor, and well people you meet at conferences. Um, so I will structure this talk with a few forwards that actually Alessa covered some of them, but not all. So we'll discuss that. And we'll also discuss what goes a bit before writing a paper. Aside from research, I believe that there are a few things you should do actively to, that will help you when you start writing a paper. Um, then we'll discuss well, the anatomy of a paper and then have some few questions. And then that where it's more personal, I will share how I tend to write a paper and some techniques that hopefully might, might help you to go from a blank page to a fully submitted paper and hopefully uh, understood by your peers and then present it somewhere. Um, so as some forward, uh, yeah, why is it for this workshop? Uh, so Alessa mentioned that uh, different perspectives are good and I agree. And well, yeah, it's that papers, it's the main way we communicate with our peers. Uh, we have conferences, we might have online talks, some videos, but the reference is always the paper. And fortunately or unfortunately, that's how we also are evaluated in academia. Um, and also at the same time, I aware it can seem a bit overwhelming initially, um, partly because Nowadays, you have to do a lot yourself, and some part of it used to be done by professionals, notably the typesetting and the printing and all of that. And now you have much more controls with LaTeX, but you have many more things to care about initially. So if it's a bit overwhelming initially, that's normal. And well, you will learn and get used to it, and ultimately it will give you more control. Um, some disclaimer, um, yeah, keep in mind that some papers or books are written over months or even years. And uh, there is always a deadline. There is one in three weeks for middle. Um, but yeah, don't burn yourself for that one. There is always something else. It's just not worth it to put, not worth it, um, to put your health or mental health at risk for a paper. And keep also in mind that regression is part of the process. Uh, Alessa mentioned uh my awards uh, but that's just half of the story or maybe half of the story i have many more rejected papers um one with a record of four rejection before being accepted somewhere sometimes it was justified sometimes it was not but it's part of the process so you have to learn to deal with it and if it's rejected it's fine and then yeah uh this talk is about how personally i write papers or actually how i attempt to write papers um, I will give you advice today is that I did not follow myself recently that ended up in rejected papers. And yeah, it's a continuous process to find what works for you. And that's something that you develop during your PhD and over your whole career, actually. Um, so some other readings about specifically paper writing that really helped me. Um, there is this paper from uh, How to Write Mathematics from Paul Almos that I really like. And even if you're not about mathematics, uh, really the core of it is about conveying an, an idea in a clear fashion. And I think there's a lot of good bits to take from that. I quote a few in this talk, but I think it's an interesting good talk, quick read. Um, there is also this book about typography that helped me a lot. Uh, it's not just to be pedantic about typography, but it helped me to understand what LaTeX was trying to achieve. And that's when I stopped fighting with LaTeX and now I work with it. And I know, especially when it comes to figure placement, that's usually the number one complaint about LaTeX. Uh, but once you understand what it's trying to do from a typographic point of view, it becomes much easier and ultimately it makes things uh, much more bearable, especially when you're close to a deadline and you have a page limit to fit. Um, so yeah, to start with a quote from Paul Almos, um, here the problem is to communicate an ID. Uh, to do so and to do it clearly, you must have something to say. So then your research uh, before needs to be done. But um, you must have someone to say to. Here it's our community, but you need to know your public what's their background, what do they know, what's their niche. 
And you must organize what you want to say and you must arrange it in the order you want it said in. So that's the paper writing part. And so before writing, something that will then help you when you write a, writing, a paper, um, I find that well, reading scientific papers and then practicing to summarize them is really helpful because you get used to summarize uh, efficiently other people's ID. And when, when comes the day when you need to summarize your own IDs in a, in a small space, uh, you're already trained in that. And reviewing papers is also part uh, the other side of the story, as Alessa mentioned. So there is concurrently a paper on a, a, a presentation on paper review that will be recorded. So being reviewer helps also to write papers and vice versa. Once you've been on both sides, uh, then a lot of things, you have a quick haha moment and you understand more the other person. Then especially if you're not a native speaker. Uh, if you're a native with speaker, well, congratulations. But for those who are not, uh, some people like to do a list of interesting formulation that uh, they can reuse over time. And overall, I try to uh, push people to actually read books, non-certific books also. Uh, my personal favorite be being <coughs> Tolkien when it comes to improving your English and vocabulary because... Uh, he was really keen about language and creating language. And so there is really a rich vocabulary that trickled down in your mind when reading that, I found. And then the last thing to do, let's say a bit before uh, actually writing the paper is to master your tools, being LaTeX, your tech editor, text editor, how to plot figures automatically, um, how to use Git and all. And the point here is that you, that re can remove a lot of friction during the paper writing process so that you have more time and uh, mental bandwidth to focus on your paper if your tools don't get in your way, but instead help you. Um, so now let's go for, let's say, the anatomy of a paper, uh, which by now should seem familiar to you and it might seem boring, but what I want to stress here is that that the order and the parts of the paper as they are printed uh, but that's not the order where it is read. At least that's my personal reading order uh, when I read a paper. You might notice that the abstract is the, the last thing that I read. Uh, the conclusion, I read it twice, and I go, tend to go backward within the paper. And it's to stress uh, the point that uh, a scientific paper is rarely uh, read from front to back, neither by the reviewer or your readers. And some people will spend a few minutes on your paper, just skimming through it. Some will spend a few hours, not just reviewers, but other researchers that want to build upon your work or compare to it. And also people might come back to it after a few months or years. Sometimes I remember a paper, I discuss it at a conference, I say, oh yes, that might interest you. And the key point is that information should be easy to find without reading each sentence in the paper, just having a look at it uh, the reader should be able to know where to find what they want to find, and it should stand out. Um, and now I will give some uh, still overview of the different section, but yeah, keep in mind that that's the uh, order where it is printed, not the order you write it, and not the order where people will read it. Um, but still, the title, uh, you should keep it short and informative. Don't try to put everything in there, it's too much. And that's also how researchers start to notice your paper in a list, uh, either during the paper bidding process for the reviews or when you open the program of a conference. So um, that's the first way to get noticed in the crowd of all the papers. Um, the abstract, it should be the synthesis of a paper and it should, it should discuss very quickly, uh, well, what you're trying to do, motivation, a bit, how you do it or what question you answer and the main results. And I'll keep in mind that the abstract, basically it's usually uh, read in pair with the title. You notice the title that seems interesting, interesting and then you read the abstract. And, but then when you actually, uh, then you might decide to read the paper or not. But then when the paper is actually read, the abstract is maybe less important at that time. It's really 
when people are trying to figure out what to read because they cannot read everything. Uh, the introduction, that's where the core of the paper really starts. You, you have to re explicit what is the field and why it is of interest. Uh, keep in mind that people might be from different niche. A reader might come from different subfield. And you should explicit which sub -problem, sub problem you want to tackle and how and why the current literature is not sufficient to solve it. Um, and it's very important to, to, to explicit that from the get go because uh, some paper I, I read or even review and after a few pages, I have no idea what their setting is and what truly they are trying to achieve because the introduction was not completely clear on what they are trying to achieve. Um, so yeah, that's also where you can put an overview of your contribution. You can see it both as a summary and a teaser and let's say to, to prepare the reader for the follow-up. And that's where I find that having a good figure can really help to understand what you're trying to do. You have the words, you have the, the images, and that can really bring that together so that by the end of the introduction, there is no uh, confusion about, about what it's about. And then comes the rated works section, which in a way is not very easy to write. And uh, well, Alessa already discussed that, but uh, very nice uh, introduction because yeah, uh, you have to be fair to the researcher's work. Uh, you have to say why the literature is not sufficient. Otherwise you would have no research question to answer. Um, but it's not about bashing them, why it's by just you have to state clearly why it's not sufficient or why it's not applicable, why, why. And it should not either just be a list of methods. Uh, sometimes I see paper, I review papers that just list as many loosely related works without really tying it down. But no, the related work is really the basis of your methods. Uh, there is an often seen quote that we are standing on the shoulders of giants. Mm -hmm. And that's the rated works that you're standing on. Um, so yeah, if you go for pseudo writing, you can say that A did X and they did that and that, but it's not applicable. And then you should say why precisely. Um, so that's what you will put in a rated works and that will be reused probably later on in the experimental section. But then usually comes the main part of your paper uh, when you either present your method um, at middle, usually it's a method or what's your research question. And that's where you have to fin usually it should already be motivated uh, why it's worth doing. But then you start for the how, how it is done. What, how do you do it? And you can support it with mathematical uh, notation if that's relevant, uh, with code if that's relevant. And also the same figures or more figures to truly explain it. At the same time, not everything is put uh, in there. And some of them can be left in the appendix or in the public code. It's up to you to find the balance. And once you have a clear uh, method, how it is, uh, let's say, explained, um, I will mention now we'll also put the slides online at the end of the talk. So you can also go back at it. Um, once you describe the method or let's say a bit some of your question you want to answer, Usually you have, you describe the experimental setting, how you will benchmark it, how you will test it. Uh, and that's where you mention different data sets you want to experiment on, which metrics, why those metrics are relevant uh, for your talk, what are your main hyperparameters, why you can still delegate some of those details in the code. Uh, you should have the main things that are available and also which methods you will comp compare to if that's relevant. Uh, so that's why it's related to the related works section that what appears there should already have been motivated in the related works section. Uh, you don't have to compare to everything in the related works section, just a subset of it that's relevant and uh, still gives a good overview of what you're doing. Um, so yeah, you can say it's this data set and we use those metrics and that's how we, we implement it. And yeah, no need to have that much prose, but uh, that's the type of section that people go back to know exactly what you did. So information sh should stand out and be clear in that section. Uh, in the results, um, not to be confused with the discussion that happen often, uh, for now you should just 
state the result both, both qualitatively and quantitatively. Uh, if that's if you're in computer vision, you might have some fancy images to show. Uh, you might have some tables with some numbers. You might have some plots, some graphs, some uh, box plots, something that both gives the numbers and a way to visualize it. And for now, you're just stating uh, factually how things work or don't work by how much. Uh, you're not interpreting it yet. That comes usually afterwards in the discussion. Uh, now you have the results, you know what the numbers are. Uh, what's the consequence? Uh, does it validate your ID? Uh, is, does it answer your research question? Uh, is it expected or unexpected? That's where uh, you discuss all that. And uh, yeah, if you still have some limitation, be honest, mention it, it's fine. You, you won't solve everything at once, most likely. And I will also mention that if you claim now to solve everything, uh, future you will hate you. Because then when you need to do a follow-up paper and you already claim to have solved the problem, uh, then you're stuck. So yeah. Don't oversell your paper. It's bad to begin with and worse for you in the future. Um, so yeah, in pseudo writing, it can be, it works. Therefore, that, 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 and that. But we still have that much to do. And the conclusion, that's where you will also summarize your findings. So you can, um, it's good to remind which problem did you solve, not with a copy and paste, but f a with a different phrasing. How did you address or answer the question? By how much? And yeah, you can have usually that's where there is opening. What remains? Or now that this is done, what is exciting new work that should be done and left for future you? Um, the bibliography, there is not that much to say because it's done by LaTeX. So you, the only two important things that you need to do is to make sure that the journals and all are up to date. Uh, especially in our field, there are a lot of things on archive. Um, so by the time, between the time when you read a paper and you cite it, it, it might get actually published. So uh, check this information and also make sure to avoid duplicates. So the only two small things with the bibliography, it's very easy to avoid. Um, and the appendix, keep in mind that it's not a mandatory part of the paper. So reviewers should probably not or won't have time to read it or you should not read it to understand the paper. So uh, you don't necessarily need to have it, but you should see it as a, um, how to dig more into a paper. If you want to know more, read the appendix, but it's not the core part of the paper. So always keep that in mind when trying to decide what goes into the paper and what goes into the appendix. The appendix is optional. Um, so yeah, I think that's about 20 minutes, but uh, we can have a first round of questions now, if you, if some people have some. Otherwise I'll keep going. You can either put your question in the chat, you can do that all the time, or I'll also just unmute yourself or I stand and then directly ask questions. It's I'm not sure wait a few good. seconds, otherwise we uh, can continue. Then we have more maybe later. Okay, so I suppose I will keep going and we have more, even more time near the end for questions. Um, so yeah, now that we see a bit what goes into a paper, or how do you go from a blank page or empty file? into an actual paper. And one of the first things to figure out personally um, is to find out what's your best uh, writing time slot. I don't think anyone can write for like eight hours a day, uh, tops a few hours. So, and some people are better in the morning, some in the evening or in between. So you need to, to, to figure out what works for you. And that will change between people and their life situation. So that's important to figure out uh, and to build your schedule around that. Um, but then, yeah, you know when to write, uh, when you're efficient. What I like to do is to, well, I start from the paper template from the conference. And then what I do, I just write sparsely. I just fill ideas there and there as the flow goes. I'm not trying to have 
super nice pros for now. Um, just put IDs when I have IDs and also start to put placeholders for like figures and tables. I'm not feeling them and just building a skeleton of what how I see the paper once complete. And uh, that's the skeleton that I will uh, uh, feel later. But now it, I think once you have, let's say, a skeleton of your paper, when you think you know the flow of your ideas and what's the order, you will uh, say it, uh, to quote Paul Almos again. I think it's a good time to ask for feedback and I will detail a bit more about feedback later, but now it's a good time to have a feedback on the flow, most likely from your supervisor. Do they think it's a good way to present your ideas? Um, if not, you can still rework that part. You're, you haven't committed too much into it. And if it's good, or if you think, yeah, that makes sense, you can still modify things later, but then you can start committing more and start filling the different section, but not necessarily, not necessarily with uh, with the priority. You don't have to start with the introduction. Usually, personally, I spend more time in the methodical section and then results and discussion and uh, introduction, conclusion tends to be done at the end. Uh, abstract, I do it at the very, very end to once the paper is basically done. Um, but yeah, I start filling question without priority uh, section without priority and then also put the result if that's not done there uh, I make sure that I didn't make statements that are contradicted by my results um, it's always good to check that and then by now by now means probably over a few days or a few weeks probably um, you start it's a good time to start refining the paper from beginning to end uh, and to iterate over that. That's uh, the key point uh, when writing a paper. It's about iteration. You don't write it uh, at once in one shot. Or you can, but probably won't be as good as it could be. Um, and then by this point, uh, if you have a page limit, I think for middle it's eight pages this year. I'm not sure, but uh, um, you it's fine if you're over the page limit at this point. Um, because now you will get to to the last part of the paper and you will compress the, the paper. And compressing here, it doesn't mean putting all the figures as small as possible. It means rereading the paragraph and figure out what is a bit redundant, uh, what could be made more straight to the point, or what maybe is not as important as you thought. It could be appendix. Um, to my personal rule of thumb is that uh, if before the deadline, you're, let's say, one or two pages of the, if a few days before, you're one or two pages over the page limit, it's fine. You will manage to shrink it down uh, because you haven't, yeah, you haven't re reworked uh, too much your writing yet. And usually you can manage to be much more straight to the point. Uh, but that's how I do it. Uh, ultimately, you will have to find what works for you, what... Uh, what works and what doesn't work, that's what you learn over the years. Um, but to give an idea about the first draft, I think that's uh, that's one of my first draft for a paper from a few years ago. And I think that's what I shared to my supervisor. I said, okay, I have this idea. Uh, I will plan it loosely in that way. Do you think it's good or is it bullshit? And that's the starting point. And then you just feel it and you might move sections as you go, but at least you you know where you're going. About the language, well, we write uh, in English, but keep in mind this not American English, it's not British English. Uh, we tend to use, uh, some people call it globish or scientific English. It's a weird mix of the different variants around. Um, but still, it's English and you should still use your own vocabulary. Don't try to use different words to sound fancy. You should be as natural as you can. Um, keep in mind that, yeah, some typographic convention might be different from your native language. So some things might seem wrong to you, possibly, but uh, you you will have to learn that. Uh, and if possible, ask for proofreading from a native speaker, if possible. Uh, while keeping in mind that, yeah, indeed, there are differences between American English, British, and uh, even Australian, for all, uh, for all we know. Um, and then, yeah, I talked a lot about iterating, how to iterate over paper. 
Um, ideally, you spread it over weeks or months, but I assume that usually that's not how it goes. So you have much less time to iterate. So a few personal tips that work for me to how to actually accelerate um, the iteration. Basically, you need to clear your mind from the paper and come back at it with a fresh mind. So the best thing to do is to sleep. Uh, if you're overworked, you won't write a good paper. You won't be happy either. So honestly, just sleeping uh, is quite a good uh, advice, I find. And also, yeah, it will clear your mind and you, you'll come back to the paper uh, with a fresh view. So that's exactly what you're trying to achieve. Come back with a fresh view. Um, exercise, sport, or social activity bonded time, it's fine also. You might be tempted to not leave your lab when the deadline is nearing, but it's perfectly fine to go out with friends if you say, okay, I spent this amount of time out outside, then I go back writing. Then you clear all your mind, you enjoy, and then you go, you go back at it and you're not stressed because of it. But yeah, just staying in front of the computer to try to write actually uh, doesn't work at all. Something else that I like to, for my iteration, I like to print the paper and just go with a pen. And ultimately, the point is to vary the different way you see the paper. Uh, if you're always in front of the same screen with the same PDF viewer, with the same settings, um, yeah, you will get bored to death and you will stop noticing things. So it's a good way to have a different way to see the paper. Um, but that's because I'm a very visual person. I know some people are not. Uh, some people might like, for all I know, you mean you might be among the people that like to read it out loud of having someone read it to them. And then you should notice something else about your prose. Maybe it's a bit boring. Maybe it's redundant. Maybe you reuse the same words too much, but you haven't noticed yet. So that could be different ways to truly iterate uh, on your paper when you don't have that much time. Um, at the same time, when you're about to explain your ideas or your method or your research question, uh, I'll go back quoting Halmos that you should, you should anticipate and avoid the reader's difficulties. Uh, so as you write, you must keep trying to imagine what in the words being written may tend to mislead the reader and what will set him right. So uh, basically you have to figure out how the reader could misinterpret you or misunderstand you. And it's not that the reader is stupid, nor that the reviewer is bad at his job. Uh, it's just that people come with different perspectives, different contexts, and they might completely misunderstand you uh, if they don't start with the same information. So you have to try to see that. And uh, to, to something that I find can help uh, it's not just to explain right off the bat what you're trying to do. Um, I, I prefer to tell a story and to really be honest. How did you come up with your method? How did you refine your research question? Uh, why are you doing something and not something else? Usually there is some motivation and basically you start from the related works and you build on top of it. Um, really, you add pieces and uh, new reflection on top of it. Uh, <clears throat> and yeah, at the same time, uh, so half of the uh, half of the art of good writing is the art of omission. So you should not, as I mentioned, you should not draw the reader in all the small details. Uh, some of them are perfectly good to be in the appendix. Some of them are perfectly good to be in the public code. Um, so just say what's needed. Uh, reintroduce what's needed. Don't just assume they know everything because they might not. They probably don't actually. Um, and yeah, something to uh, a rule of thumb that I use is that sometimes it takes me months to notice something. And even if in insight it seems obvious, it did not to me and it probably does not for the reader. So uh, if it took you some time to notice something or find it, then it's probably good to say it explicitly uh, in the paper, not to mention it as trivial or obvious. Um, and then what really helps also is to have good figures, good pictures. And uh, I believe that one of the skills to develop during, let's say, a PhD is also uh, how to plot your figures and uh, something that are relevant for your field. Um, 
I know Matplotlib is popular. I very much dislike it because it's very tricky to use and it's very annoying initially. So at the start of a PhD, at least to me, making a new figure took about, let's say, one afternoon from start to finish. And to connect to what I said earlier about mastering your tools, if you automate that part, your figures, it will be easy to modify. Um, because otherwise you have a figure you think is good, then your supervisor shows up and asks you to increase just a tiny bit the size of the font. And if it's not automated, you spend another afternoon doing that. So that's where it's useful to have automated stuff and to illustrate properly what you're trying to do. Um, then, yeah, as I mentioned, you should not try to sound smart. Uh, if your method and paper is good, you don't need that. But on the contrary, it's the reader sh that should fit smart. Uh, you should basically, ideally, uh, the reader should guess the next idea or the next solution or the next step. Um, some writers or some vulgarizers are very good at it. And when I read them, I, f I feel smart because I guess everything, but uh, actually they are just nudging me into, uh, into their point. So that's what you should strive for. It's difficult to do, and that's where iterating is useful, uh, but being honest about what you're trying to convey is the first good first step for that. And then uh, it might ring a bell to the French speaker around. I suppose there are a few. Um, whatever is well conceived is clearly said and the words to say it flow with ease. Uh, well, it was in context of poetry, but it's very relevant for us. And the cor corollary of that is that if you struggle a bit to describe your ideas, to explain what you're trying to do, maybe that is not as clear as it should be to begin with. So it might be good to take a step back and go back on the drawing board. Um, is your method as simple as it could be? Or is your research question actually trying to answer different questions at the same time? Maybe you have multiple goals and ideas that should be spread in different papers. Uh, that's something that I did last year, having a paper rejected twice now that yeah goes a bit all over the place because there is not a clear message in it and that's something you should look for to have one clear easy to understand message you can have some uh, other part in it but the core of the paper should be very easy to explain um, then if you use some mathematical notation that might not be relevant for everyone but uh, LaTeX uh, gives you a lot of different facilities for like font, font styles. And that's a good way to complement your prose. Uh, the way I see it, you have the prose, what you write, you have the mathematics, and you might have the code. And they're all intertwined, working together, but they are not a duplicate. And it can be a good way to uh, basically um, convey some semantics about the writing without uh, in a very concise way. Uh, so here in this famous paper, basically it's used to differenti differentiate between the Proto-German and the Gaulish uh, without, while enabling the reader to understand it. And you can use similar uh, tricks in a way uh, in your paper to differentiate between uh, functions, vectors, tensors, uh, what's a prediction, what's an annotation. So keep that in mind. Uh, if you use some math, you're not writing code. There is a code and it has a meaning and you should use the facilities of the math to say it in a different way. But speaking of code, uh, we'll have a talk uh, later by Attila about uh, reproducibility and uh, yeah, public code. And yeah, make it public if you can, um, because then well, it's good for reproducibility, but then you can reference it in the manuscript. So it can make your life easier. You don't have to re-explain everything. You can give a broad overview and then, then point to the code. And it's good to archive it uh, publicly, not necessarily on GitHub or all. Um, then yeah, we still have time. Um, when it comes to ask for feedback, we discussed that earlier. Uh, it's good, yeah, to ask feedback from outsiders, not just your supervisor, not just your co-author, but outsider here meaning can be other PhD students from your lab, colleagues from abroad or others, or even your uh, university friends for that matter. And it's important because they don't know your project. 
just as the reader won't know your project and the reviewer won't know your project. So if they are confused, reviewer will probably be confused. If something could be improved, that's a good time to address it. But at the same time, when you ask for feedback, you should be clear on what type of feedback you want. If you just want um, a feedback on the structure or on the flow, um, someone pointing out typos and mistakes in the grammar is not useful and vice versa. If you're just a few hours before the deadline and you're ch checking the English, someone telling you, yeah, maybe you should flip uh, the order of the paper, that's not relevant. So uh, be clear on what type of feedback you want and need. And also, yeah, uh, you have to learn to accept criticism, at least good criticism. Uh, I like to say that uh, useful feedback is annoying feedback uh, because then I have to work more. Uh, I like to hear that this is great and you will get accepted and you have nothing to modify, but usually that's not the case. Um, so yeah, you have to work more and usually that benefits the paper. So that's, I find also something to to connect a bit to what Alessa said, to something to learn. Um, and then over the years, you might, uh, let's say, build your network of proofreaders, people that you know give you good feedback to you and that you can work with. Um, but at the same time, if you ask for feedback, you probably should give feedback to others. Uh, you can share papers with other people in your lab. And keep in mind that it's always good to, important to mention the good. It can be a bit, it can be overwhelming to ask for feedback and then receive a massive list of things to improve or change. Uh, without hearing once that actually is that's a good paper. So when you give feedback to someone, don't forget to mention that because yeah, it can make quite a big difference on how it is perceived. Um, don't necessarily just point what could be improved. If you have some suggestion, do it. It will make things easier for the writer. And if you don't understand something, say it. Uh, Sometimes I had colleagues that gave me feedback uh, but they didn't understand something, but just assume, oh, maybe that's me and don't say it. But no, you should say it because if it's difficult for you to understand, it will be to others. So that's a good point, good time to address that. Then, no, just small points, but especially when the deadline is getting near, I mentioned that you can probably save space near the end if you're over the page limit. Um, actually showing the frame, you can do that in LaTeX. You don't uh, you remove it at the end, but during writing, showing the frame of uh, the margin can help you to understand to understand what LaTeX is doing the, with the figures, and then you stop fighting too much with it, and you can manage to replace it uh, nicely. Um, small quick advice that actually uh, I uh, at least help me. Um, I'll focus on the last that. You should not modify a sentence. You should not just tweak it, just write, rewrite it from scratch. Uh, more often than not, you will just screw up your grammar or end up with something that's nonsense. And that's where if you're comfortable writing and typing, you can rewrite easily. Um, I've seen full professor really struggling with a keyboard and having big issues to, to type anything. So any modification is very painful and there is a lot of copy and paste and it just, yeah, it just makes everything worse and you can end up with nonsense sentences. So just rewrite stuff. Um, so by this point, now your paper is within the page limit. You submitted it. You're not completely done yet. Um, it's the perfect time just after submission to clean up your code, the post later code and the code from experiments, if you have some, to remove the comments and to fix the indentation and to archive all of that, uh, both your later code and the results and training artifacts uh, because you will have a rebuttal or revision that will come in a few weeks or in a few months. And you might need to do new metrics or redo a figure, do a new figure, merge results. And if things are a bit all over the place and you forgot, then it will become very painful. So it's good to clean that before uh, really uh, tuning off. Um, so to summarize, I will let you read that quote uh, yourself. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, to, I think, to conclude, um, one of the main ingredients in time 
is time, especially when you're limited in, in space. Uh, you have to find a way that makes the writing fun for you. So it's up to you to find it. And hopefully some of, some of my tips and advice from today will be useful to you. And you should start early, ideally, and iterate and again and again and again. Um, so yeah, that's it for this presentation. And uh, now we can go for questions if we have some. you can see my screen. Uh, when it comes to reading uh, a paper, I usually look at the code before I read the related works. So I think it's by now it's a very natural part of a submission uh, for most journals at least. But yes, my name is Attila and I'm a PhD student from you know University in Sweden. Uh, and this will be like an updated version of the talk I gave during the Autumn Academy. And this talk is aimed at authors submitting a paper to Middle, who would also like to share their code together with their paper, for example, on a platform like GitHub. So now we will discuss how Middle is here to support you by supporting this set of reproducibility guidelines. Middle has been a big advocate of transparency since the very first conference in 2018. And this means that the entire review process and all of the accepted manuscripts are all publicly available. And they also recommend that authors share their code whenever possible. And it's commonly known, and we already talked about this, that in deep learning, your manuscript only is not enough to thoroughly describe all the details of your project, because even the small, smallest details in the code can have a large impact on your results. And when it comes to reiterating on your manuscript, you can just offload a lot of things from your paper if you describe it well in the code. So it's sort of a good way to restructure your paper as well if you have to fit into three pages or eight pages. Uh, and for these issues, uh, sharing the exact code that you have used for your project is a perfect solution. And for reference, I can say that around 55% of all papers ever submitted to Middle decided to make their code public. So it's a very popular choice uh, already. And the goal here is that if another researcher decides to read your paper and has access to the exact code that you used, then they can just use their own data set, train their own models, and they should be able to reach the exact same results and conclusions as what you did in your paper. But of course, in the real world, there are many practical difficulties in the way. So the past one and a half years now, there has been an open discussion with the middle board and the middle community about reproducibility. And by now, we are very well aware that there is an emerging crisis, but not for middle, but for the scientific field overall. Uh, and at middle, our goal is to keep this conversation alive about reproducibility and find solutions together. And for this, we propose a reproducibility guideline with three plus six questions. And this is not a requirement for your paper when you submit, but it, instead it aims to help the authors publish the best code that they can. And it will also help readers afterwards in implementing the methods that you described in the paper. So I'm using the color scheme of 2024's middle, and it made everything look a bit scary and intimidating, but uh, it, it, is, it is not scary at all. And we're just going to run through the guidelines just to show that they don't include anything major or difficult. So we have three expectations from the main body of the paper regarding reproducibility. First off, the authors should explicitly state what material is private and what's public, so we're all on the same page. They should aim to evaluate their methods on publicly available data, which is referenced appropriately, which is something that's very lacking or very often lacking. And they should also aim to publish their code, which should also be referenced appropriately. And then we can move on to all the papers that had public code, because those repositories we can evaluate even further. And for running this code in a new environment, a list of packages are required. And this list should be included in your repository. If your paper proposes a new state-of-the-art approach, we recommend to share the model weights. So it can then be easily compared to other, uh, other people or other, uh, by other people to other methods. And your codes for training and evaluating the models should also be named appropriately and that they should be easy to find. And finally, after all of the previously mentioned points, uh, 
you should properly address the documentation of your repository and there should be licensing in place so people know what they can use your code for. And this guideline is nothing novel. It's just a collection of reasonable expectations from a code repository. And of course, there are many papers where some of these questions are not applicable. So instead of just uh, yes or no answers, you can also, of course, answer not applicable in many cases. And from these six code related questions, we can also assign a score for each repository between zero and six, which we will look at later on. And as a side note, these guidelines are pretty dynamic. So we have changed and adjusted them based on feedback from the community as well. So the most recent version will always be available on the middle website. And I put the link there as well. And on the surface, uh, these nine questions might sound like they are a lot of work, but I can assure you that they are not. And most of them require just a few minutes of, of, of your time. And although they are not a requirement, uh, but if you follow these guidelines or follow any other similar guidelines, they can really uh, help the scientific field overall. And as even further motivation, we have also collected the average number of citations for the papers accepted to middle, and we plotted them against how well they performed regarding these guidelines that we proposed. And on average, we can actually see that the, the code repositories that fulfill more of the guidelines generally have a higher number of citations. So that's some additional motivation for authors on why focus on your code. And with these guidelines in place, we have evaluated all of the submissions uh, to middle since 2018. And our focus was to see how things developed over the years. And all of our evaluations are, of course, publicly available. So you can find a link on the middle website as well. Uh, the increasing popularity of middle can be seen from the growing number of submissions throughout the years. There's a small probably COVID related drop in 2021, but then ever since the numbers keep increasing again, fortunately. And with the number of submissions on the rise, we can actually see that the popularity of code repositories and using public data sets is also increasing, which is very promising. However, for our evaluations of code repositories, we found no signs of improvements whatsoever in any of the categories. To break it down, uh, for example, almost half of all of the repositories missed to include package dependencies that are actually required to be able to run their code, which means that in just a few years of time, it will be almost impossible to get the exact version numbers that they used uh, for running their code. And additionally, with just one line of code, you can actually export all of the used packages that, that, that you used uh, in your environment with their exact version numbers as well for both PIP and Anaconda and probably for any other virtual environment that you might be using as well. And it really helps reproducibility a lot. Um, including your code with proper names for training and evaluating your model is actually pretty common. The, the repositories that miss this are generally the ones that are still completely empty as of today. Uh, however, including your trained model weights is much less popular. So even though they make the proposed met method a lot more easy to, to use and just uh, compare your methods to, it's still very lacking. And the documentation and licensing of repositories is it just also shows great room for improvement, although both of them really severely limit the readers in using the code and understanding it. We also made up our own metric as well, which is sort of like a combined metric. Uh, and it means that if your repository contains the required package dependencies and the training and the evaluating code, which are the first three points of the guidelines, then uh, we deem your experiment as repeatable. And you can see that less than half of all repositories were deemed repeat re repeatable based on these metrics. Uh, to sort of put the extent in, in perspective, in 2018, there were nine repositories that we couldn't even get started on reproducing, whereas with the number of citation, uh, number of submissions uh, increasing, the same number is now 35 for last year. So we can't even get started on trying to retrain the models that they proposed. Um, we introduced these guidelines sometime before the 2023 conference, 
So we really expected that, we, that the average score would increase, but instead they even slightly decreased. Uh, and although the decline is not statistically significant, uh, we can see that the spread of the scores, so the, the standard deviation of the scores is much larger than for previous years. And in fact, if you look at the repositories individually, you can see that in 2023, there is a very high percentage of repositories that are of very good quality, but there are also around 15 that are still today completely empty. So the authors either must have forgotten to push the latest version of their code on GitHub, or they just forgot to make their repository public. However, there's still nothing available under the links in their already published papers. So it's just a, it's a dead link. It, it leads uh, nowhere. And there are even papers from 2018 that just simply say that uh, the code will be released upon publication. But uh, six years down the line, still nothing happened. So the first priority now is that we would not like that to happen in 2024. So that's why the guidelines are still in place. And we would like to add a little bit more interaction as well uh, during the paper submission. So I will say it again that the guidelines are not at all a part of the submission requirements. So the quality of your code repository will have no impact on the review of your paper. However, during the rebuttal phase, you might get questions if you have a link to your repository, but it doesn't contain the code yet. But this is not something that you should feel stressed about. Instead, it will just give you an opportunity to discuss your, uh, your code and just in general reproducibility with your co-authors. And if you're uncertain about sharing your code, keep in mind that it's also perfectly fine not to share it. So instead, what we're trying to encourage is that if you've already committed to sharing your code, uh, make sure that it actually leads to a working repository and make sure that it's the best quality that you can make it. And that's why the guidelines are here to help. So the motivation behind the guidelines is, uh, is a clear and it's a concerning problem. But what the questions do is they sort of outline this problem to see where most uh, code repositories fail. However, it's not a very clear solution and we don't propose a clear solution, we propose a discussion and we are very open to suggestions on how to change the guidelines or what other things that we could do to help you as an author. And uh, we have the opportunity to discuss your ideas now or you can also get in touch via email. And with that, I would like to thank you all for listening. Thank you very much for this uh, very nice uh, presentation. Um, it summarizes uh, very nicely what you already or what we discussed uh, in the last um, a bit longer section. So um, there we had a lot more time, of course. Any questions uh, for Attila so far? So there's one, what, uh, what would be good Findable places to publish trained model weights. Where to put? Yeah. Um... yeah. Uh, yes, exactly. There's already an answer by, but thank you. Done. <laughs> but it, it depends on the size of your model. I, I see a lot of models that are small enough so that they fit in uh, on GitHub. I think their limit is 250 megabytes, but you can also increase that limit to something like one gigabyte uh, in the settings. So you can uh, put pretty large models on GitHub as well. And we have the question if we should also include the code that was used to generate figures for the paper. Uh, if you're willing, then uh, absolutely. Uh, but at least the code that you used for generating the, the numbers that you used in the figures. But uh, it, it becomes a, a question of how much time you're willing to put into having a nice code repository. But of course, if you have the code in a presentable way already, then why not? Maybe that also is a very good question because it's not just about the figures, but often also about the statistical analysis that you do to make points because the one thing of course the code uh, um, to get out your segmentation or your classification results but that is of course not uh, the whole story about your paper um, what do you think about that part should that be more um, part of the repository as well uh, there's a the part of the guidelines 
of evaluating the model is sort of like masking all of these. So it, it should be the code that you use to get every single data point that you used in your evaluations. But I don't think I have ever seen that happen, that all of the, the tables, like how you filled up the tables, all of that is available in uh, code. Uh, so uh, it's it's sort of the same answer. Uh, go for it, but it's it's very rare. And also for me, I think for every table, I might have two or three different files that I use. You, you know, one one code to evaluate one method, and another code to evaluate another method. So it's the the more you can do, the the merrier. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, then we have the question if. Uh, is pushing the code into our personal account containing our personal info allowed during the anonymized reviewing process? Um, right. Well, uh, maybe... <laughs> no, go, go on. <laughs> yeah, maybe because it's not really a question for you, but um, the nice thing of metal this year is that uh, we don't have a double blind, but single blind as a review process. And that exactly... Um, solve the problem because uh, you as an author are known, meaning you can then also um, publish already your code if you like. Of course, you can also think about if that is the correct moment. Often you also see that um, also say, OK, I will publish it after um, submission um, because they are afraid that if they are rejected, that someone else steals the code or something. So that are concerns. Um, but yeah, at the moment, that is not a problem. And that's very nice. Yeah, I also already answered the question for uh, um, submissions where you do have a double blind review process. There is exactly this website where you can also upload your code and it's still in an anonymized version. Do you want to add something to that? No. Nope. Uh, no, but what I wanted to say is, but uh, now that's uh, not relevant, uh, that you can just write that your code will be published upon acceptance, but during the rebuttal phase, you you can sort of already start doing those steps if uh, by looking at the reviews, just at least put up the URL in your manuscript. Mm -hmm. Then we have a question regarding the baseline methods. Um, oh, I jumped. Uh, should that uh, also be included? So especially when you play around with hyperparameters uh, or other things in the code of a baseline method. Uh, yes, if even if you've used the code from other literature, you have your own code based on theirs where you generate the results of that method. So at that point, that's already your your code. So I think it's as much part of your uh, source code as the, the results generating your own method. And what if I played with some hyperparameters or had to change, for example, the data loader? Uh, generally, the hyperparameters that you used for training the model that's presented in the paper, that should be included. And But and then you can uh, discuss what kind of hyperparameters that you played with already maybe in the manuscript. Yeah, thank you. Any further questions? So what is the most important thing authors should now keep in mind um, when there is this deadline in three weeks, uh, something like that? What should I do now? What should I do directly after submission um, to maybe focus a little bit on uh, one or two points? Uh, maybe use the get guidelines to see if your code is organized completely differently or not, because I think the guidelines also help with just wrapping your head around the code that you have. Um, and also talk with your co-authors about if you can share your code on, or not. And if you can't, that is perfectly fine, but then make sure not to put in uh, the link to your GitHub repository just out of because it's it's popular and other other papers do it. It's perfectly fine if you don't, or it's perfectly fine if you can't. Uh, and then if they say yes, and if you decide to 
make your code publicly available, then I would recommend reading the full detailed guidelines to get some more help. And also reach out uh, if you need any further, further information. But yes, at first, first I would recommend uh, a discussion. Thank you very much. Are there any further questions? Otherwise, I would like to thank all three uh, presenters again. Uh, it was very nice, uh, very insightful what you have presented, and I hope we will get uh, a lot of um, even better um, papers. Um, thank you. And we will also send you a feedback form um, later the week um, to ask what you have thought about uh, this workshop and what you would like to have also for the next iterations etc so please take the time and fill that out because it means that you can benefit from it or also the next uh, new phd candidates can benefit um, from improved workshops as well thanks for that and now we are ending with that part of the workshop and go into individual rooms so i will create five breakout rooms um, and then we will have in one room, Yanis and the first one, and the second one, Joel, the third, me, and I'm not sure, Attila, do you also still have some time to answering more individual questions? Then yes. maybe for a bit, then of, uh, in the fourth, Attila, and then a fifth, just for um, chatting a little bit, or maybe about ChatGPT, or just networking with someone else, whatever you like. Then we just go into the rooms and you can ask more individual questions about your paper when you still uh, want some feedback or something like that. Okay, then open all rooms. Now the rooms should be opened and um, you can just join the rooms. <laughs>